saving recipes and, and um, to me. And that was the genesis of the idea. But the, it came to fruition. Uh, my mom has been sick, had, had been sick for, uh, had been sick for uh, going on four years now. And she had, she had cancer. And she uh, survived not only a, a, a serious operation, but she survived two years of chemo. And she's 81. And so she's a tough old woman and, uh, and hard-headed too. And, uh, and so there are two reasons to do this. One was, you know, she refuses to wear a hospital gown. So she, she just will not wear a hospital gown. And that doesn't mean she's streaking through regional <laughs> medical centers. But she wears her clothes. She wears in the hospital bed in intensive care wears her khaki pants and her her you know two pairs of socks <laughs> and her her men's shirt because mom's tall you know really tall I and mean, she's almost tall as i am and um and uh and her khaki jacket uh it looks like she's getting ready to go trout fishing <laughs> And she, um, you know, she, she's the only person I know that you have to take clothes to in the hospital on a regular basis. So, I, you know, we were very worried about her. And, uh, and I went in the kitchen and there was, it was just wrong. There was a, you know, it usually smelled like bacon grease, you know, from that. Sometimes it was a ceramic jar, sometimes it was a plain old mayonnaise jar, and sometimes it was a, a, a cheap aluminum thing to keep her bacon grease in. And with us, it was often grease from, from fat back. My mama thinks fat back is health food. And, you know, <laughs> so she, yeah, exactly. And, 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 uh, but that, you know, had long since been thrown out because mom was in the hospital for months, you know, and, and, and in uh, rehab for months. And um, all together. And, um, you know, it usually smelled like bacon cornbread and it smelled like biscuits and it smelled like pinto beans and ham or it smelled like, you know, beef short ribs which for three days it would smell like beef short ribs. You know? <laughs> if you make baked beans the way that we make baked beans, you know, you mix your ketchup and your mustard and your cayenne powder and your little bit of garlic powder and a little bit of garlic salt. We got nothing against processed spices. <laughs> uh, you know, Maybe a little bit of Worcestershire if you got it, but you know, a chopped, finely diced white onion, maybe a finely diced green pepper, but no more than half and half because you know, you get bitter if you put right. Too much green pepper can be a little bitter, and and all that is fine, but what made it good was that lattice work of of thick cut bacon. And I'm not talking about one strip going one way. I'm talking about <laughs> and and yeah, that bacon that doesn't crisp it to nothing. But when you know you I mean, you know, look I know this is terrible, but when you pull it out of there, you know, you pull it out first, take the tin foil off, then you put it back in there. Because the bacon's already melted into the beans, so now you want it to crisp. So you take the foil off, put it back in there, and I mean it disintegrates. I mean by the time you get it out, spoon it out, it has no texture. It's like butter. I mean the pork fat is like butter. How can you not like that? <laughs> 
So that's what our, and if you want a good smell, and that's what our kitchen smelled like. It also smelled like fresh cantaloupe. You know, y'all know how cantaloupe smells, you know. We never ate cantaloupe a day in my life that we didn't have gravy and biscuits with it. And, you know, frying sausage. Um, you know, grits don't really have a great smell, but the way mama cooked them, they seem to. But all that was gone. And instead, there was this old, <coughs> cold, burnt iron smell. And, uh, you know, the old iron skillets have a smell to them. And, uh, and lemon-scented dishwashing detergent. Although, <laughs> no lemon dishwashing detergent had ever touched her iron skillets. Mm -hmm. You know, but, but just her pots and pans, you know, that were all clean and all put away. And it, it just you know, and it and for reasons, God, did you and I talk? I think we talked about this. It it terrified me. You know, I walked in there and it, it scared me to death. And um, so that was one reason. The other reason was when I asked her. You know, um, Mama, how'd you cook this? How'd you cook that? Where's the recipe? Well, I knew, I mean, I'd never seen her refer to a book, but I thought that somewhere in the kitchen, and you know what I mean, behind a, a rack of steel spoons from the time of the Spanish-American War might be, you know, might be, uh, you know, the recipe for butter rolls. Have y'all had? Y'all know what butter rolls are, you know? Well, they're not really a roll at all, are they? I mean, they're, they're a dumpling, right? That's the closest thing. A dumpling cooked in sweet milk, sugar, vanilla, cinnamon. What else? What am I leaving out? That's about it, right? Condensed milk. And condensed milk. And of course, little cubes of butter floating in the, the milk. And then Mama would pat out. She never cut a biscuit in her life. She cut tea cakes, but she would pat out. But instead of a cat head, you know, this size, this size, she would make doll, maybe silver dollar size or maybe a little bit bigger. And then they just went swimming in that sweetened milk. And, and she would take her finger, I mean, I watched it all my life, she'd take her finger and pop them down in there, you know. And never licked her finger. I watched her. <laughs> I'd have licked mine. <laughs> but she would send them swimming and then, you know, put them in the oven and just cook it, I think, 350 until that milk had begun to thicken and steam up into those little dumplings. And then, I mean, think of the time that goes into this. Then she pulled them out. And she got us a big steel spoon, army surplus spoon, <laughs> and turned them one by one. So that, and then did that again. Now, why she couldn't do that when she turned them with a spoon, I think she just liked poking. <laughs> she would poke them with, and then they would go under, saturate with the milk again. And then she'd cook them until the milk had begun to caramelize didn't have to be thick. And the great thing about this is it's, I'm no cook, but it's forgiving. You know, if, if the milk is a little thin, it still tastes good. Spoon some of it out and put it on your dumplings. If it's thick, it tastes better. <laughs> you know, the thicker it is, the more that it steams up, cooks up into the dumpling. But it's a dumpling, and it's going to have the texture of a dumpling. Don't expect a flaky roll. They just call them butter rolls, right? Y'all know what I mean. But just, it, it's almost, and I, I don't know the chef's term, they're a little bit gummy. You know what I mean? They're a little bit gummy. Uh, but my God, I mean, it's like, you know, when, when I've heard all my life people say uh, it, it melts in your mouth, but this does, you know, so. But there was no recipe. You know, my mom, and I'll tell you why. So 
since I wrote the book, those 500 pages, I might as well use it. <laughs> Y'all can hear me all right now, back there in, in the back. It's a rare opportunity for me to read from a book because I never have my glasses and I'm blind as a stone, it seems like, without them. I can drive without them, which should make all y'all feel good. <laughs> but I cannot, uh, I can't read the lid. This is why we did this. Since she was 11 years old, even if all she had to work with was neck bones, pepper grass, or poke salad, she put good food on the plate. She cooked for dead broke uncles, hungover brothers, shade tree mechanics, faith healers, dice shooters, hairdressers, pipe fitters, crop dusters, high steel walkers, and well diggers. She cooked for iron workers, Avon ladies, highway patrolmen, sweatshop seamstresses, fortune tellers, coal haulers, dirt track daredevils, and dime store girls. She cooked for lost souls stumbling home from Aunt Hattie's beer joint and for singing cowboys on the AM radio. She cooked in her first 80 years more than 70,000 meals. As basic as hot butter biscuits with pear preserves or muscadine jelly and as exotic as tender braised beef tripe and white milk gravy in kitchens where the only ventilation was the banging of a screen door. She cooked for people she just as soon poisoned. <laughs> <laughs> and for the loves of her life. She cooked for the rich ladies in town, melting beef short ribs into potatoes and hot Spanish onions. Another woman's baby on her head. And sleepwalked home to feed her own boys home canned blackberries dusted with sugar as a late night snack. She pan fried chicken and Red's barbecue with a crust so crisp and thin it was mostly in the imagination. Hi. And deep fried fresh brim and crappie and hush puppies redolent with green onion and government cheese. She seasoned pinto beans with ham bone and baked crackling cornbread for old women who took the picks at. And stewed fat spare ribs and creamy butter beans at truck drivers would brag on 3,000 miles from home. She spiked collard greens with cane sugar and hot pepper for old men who fought the hunt on the Hindenburg line. Mm -hmm. And simmered chicken and dumplings for mill workers with cotton still stuck in their hair. She fried thin apple pies and white butter and cinnamon for the pretty young women with bus tickets out of this one horse town. And baked sweet potato cobbler for the grimy pipe fitters and dusty bricklayers they left behind. She cooked for big-haired waitresses at the Fuzzy Duck Lounge, <laughs> shiny-eyed pilgrims at the Congregational Holiness Campground, and crew-cut teenage boys who read comic books beside her banana pudding and then embarked for Vietnam. She cooked most of all to make it taste good, to make every chip melamine plate a poor man's banquet because how do you serve dull food to people such as this? She became famous for it, became the best cook in the world, if the world ends just this side of Cedartown. But she never used a cookbook, not in her life. She never cooked from a written recipe of any kind and never wrote down one of her own. She cooked with ghosts at her sure right hand, and you can believe that or not. The people who taught her the secrets of Southern blue collar cooking are all gone now. And they did not cook from a book either. Most of them did not know how to read. Every time the old woman stepped from her workshop of steel spoons, iron skillets, and blackened pots, all she knew about the food left with her and the way that when a bird flies off a wire, it just leaves a black line in the sky. Thank y'all. I would, I've said this before and y'all heard me say it before uh, I'd rather talk with you than talk at you so let's take some questions and uh, 
And, you know, if you see me bolt for the door, you'll know it was one I didn't want to answer. <laughs> I figure I could make it past the first eight or nine rows, but two of the folks in the back back there would have a good shot at me. So, Jake, you know, knock over something to distract people in case I need it. Yes, ma'am. Have you read this to your mother? I, I've read parts of it to my mother, big parts of it to my mother. Um, it, it, you know, it's out in digital form, and it's, you know, we don't really consider those to be books. You know, but, but it's done by a really good guy who's done all the books on family, a producer who gets it. You know, he's from New York, but he can't help it, and he, he gets it. And he, uh, his name is Lewis Milgram, and he, um, he and I were trapped in a studio together for seven days. Actually, not together. We, uh, he, he stayed in New York, and what's that magical demon thing, Skype? You know, he, his head floated like magic. And, and, uh, and I sat in a little glass booth and read it out loud. It took six days, five, six days. And it's 500 pages long. This book's a bargain. <laughs> I mean, if you were buying ham by the pound of bologna, you wouldn't get that much. Uh, but uh, my point, I did have a point when I started talking. But she, uh, you know, she, it comes from her. So I've read her the beginning and big hunks, chunks of it. But no, she expects me to sit down. She does not want to listen to it on a CD or digitally. And I said, Mama, it's me. And she said, no, it's not. And uh, so I will sit beside her and I will read her the entire book, front to back. And, uh, but you know, you learn something about your people when you put out a book like this. Uh, the first thing they all said was, oh, the pictures were just wonderful. <laughs> oh, the pictures were just, did you have one of John in there? You know, John, you know, you know that good picture of John in his soldier suit. Did you get to use that one? And, I tried to pick ones that would be most embarrassing to my brother's son <laughs> because he was, you know, he, he's always been bossy. And he, you know, my, my little brother Mark said that when Sam was born, he, you know, he didn't like wrap him in a blanket or, you know, anything like that. They said when Sam was born, he just dusted himself off and walked home. <laughs> but he's real bossy. And, and he, so I tried to find the le most embarrassing photographs that I could find. He's got uh, Bam Bam legs. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You remember Flintstones? Fred Flint? You know, remember Fred? Remember Bam Bam? You know, had them little short, thick legs, look like Quaker Oats boxes. He's got Bam Bam legs. So I tried to find every existing photograph of him in short pants. <laughs> There is some small victory in being a writer. And this is this is the best that I can do. So someone else? Yes, ma'am. When was the last time your mom cooked for you? Not that long ago. Probably in the past week or so. Um what she cook? Well she cooked breakfast, which is a a terrible, frightening killing thing i mean it, it i mean this is breakfast uh we call it white meat but it's fat back cooked crisp salt pork but she says is you know it's salt pork but she's you know she's she has rinsed it and rinsed it and rinsed it and soaked it and rinsed it some more but she cooks it until it literally has the consistency almost of air you know <laughs> And she doesn't like streak of lean, and neither do I. Salt, you would think that salt would collect in the fat, but it, it doesn't. I mean, try it sometime. The, the streak of lean in there is, just soaks up the, the salt, and to me, it's just too strong. So we have just crisp, fried fat back. And we have, um, and Mama says that there is no grease worthy of a good fried egg except fatback. And we had fresh biscuits, 
fat back, uh, three fried eggs with peas. <laughs> three fried eggs with peas. And one of my favorite uh, things that mom does for breakfast is she, uh, you know, we, we don't really like hash browns. Hash browns were an invention of, I think, people in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and no matter what you put in them, they're still hash browns and they're still just little tater dust. <laughs> but so, but mama doesn't do home fries either, you know, those cubed. She slices her potatoes uh, about, would you say a fourth of an inch or less? Not potato chip narrow, or that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for crisp on the outside and creamy in the middle and on the inside of the crisp skin. And, and, and for reasons that I will never understand, a daub of mustard in the plate, just a daub, and you, and you, I asked her once, Mama, why, I don't really eat the mustard on anything, why do you put a daub of mustard in there? She said, because you're so just supposed to have it. <laughs> because that's the way you eat it. <laughs> But she didn't eat it that way either. We, I guess we would call it an accoutrement. <laughs> accoutrement. <laughs> uh, I, you know, that was pretty good, you know. Uh, beef and, she cooked beef and, we, she calls it beef and taters. It's beef short ribs. Uh, but now, you know, she can't find short ribs and, you know, short ribs are expensive. If she can't find beef short ribs, she'll use other cheap cuts of beef. Um, and if she may, you know, the, the secret is not to drown it. You know, chefs will say, you know, sear the beef on the outside before you. Well, what mama did put a little bacon grease in the bottom of the, you know, the, the cook pot about that big. Put a little bacon grease in there, put the beef in there. I mean, it might sear a minute, you know. But then she covers it very quickly with just enough water to cover. That's kind of redundant, ain't it? <laughs> Author. <laughs> covers it with just enough to cover. And then she, she, um, she puts a, um, just cooks a hound out of it, then turns it down on, you know, not low, but low medium and cooks it until it falls off the bone. And then she adds her, you know, quartered potatoes, really any kind, but new potatoes come apart too soon. They don't have the right texture. Big old bacon potatoes don't have the right texture. Just a good kind of gold skin white potato is what we call arsh. Uh -huh. Arsh. Uh -huh. Arsh, potatoes. Arsh potatoes. and, oh, and Arsh potatoes. <laughs> the thing about a college town is they're always, it always takes a minute, you know. I, I need an interpreter. But, uh, and she'll, you know, put those in there and, but immediately quarters not sweet onions, but hot Spanish onions. And, you know, them kind of with a good thick skin and, you know, quarters them, or halves if they're small. You don't really need to chop them at all. They're gonna cook to pieces. And, and she cooks it with just the right amount of liquid, just enough to cover. You can't walk away from it. It ain't crock pot cooking, you know, and she cooks it until the, the liquid has cooked out of the potatoes and the potatoes have begun to kind of puff, almost like popcorn. Now they may not actually come apart, but you have that feeling when you touch it with a spoon, they come apart. And, but again, there's not a lot of liquid in there, so they're not soaking up. People say, well, it won't soak up the flavor of the cooking liquid. It's already soaked up the flavor of the cooking liquid. And, and those onions have got down in the bottom of the pot and they started to caramelize just a little bit, you know? And this is where it burns. 
This is where people, this is where it burns, right? And once it scorches this much, it's ruined. Mm -hmm. And that's the secret of her kind of Southern cooking. It's mostly stove top. You know, um, so that, she cooked chicken and dressing the other day, you know, when I first started work on this and I said, where did this recipe came from, come from, Mama? And she said, uh, "Huh, and that goes back to that time that sis shot her husband in the teeth." <laughs> so there is, which I knew then. We had us a book by. <laughs> I knew we had us a book and, uh, and two two times. One was when I found out where our recipes came from, which it was my great grandfather, Jimmy Jim Bunnell, had to be had to be retrieved. He had been involved in a very violent, which might or might not have resulted in death, a battle with a man that quite frankly nobody seemed to miss. <laughs> you know, and, but he, afraid he was going to go to prison, fled. And he fled to the mountains of North Georgia. And he hid out. Now, this is not unusual, not just for my people, but for many people back then. Mm -hmm. So he hid out. And meanwhile, my grandfather, Charlie Bunnell, married my grandma, Ava, under false pretenses. <laughs> Her false pretenses. <laughs> her sisters made a beautiful box lunch that he purchased at one of those dances where you buy the... And they lied. They wanted to get her out of the house because she was peculiar. So they cooked... They, they cooked... This wonderful meal. I mean, had pie and 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 he ate it and he fell in love and they danced and 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 then they got married and she could not cook a thing <laughs> and was this big around can't nobody on this planet that big around cook <laughs> and, and to make a long story short, and there is no such thing as y'all know in my lexicon, uh, he tried to get people to teach his new bride to cook. I mean, she would did things like this. She would like bake biscuits that were like vanilla wafers. Yeah, you know, it did not rise. And when he would say, uh, "Darling, I think the biscuits are supposed to rise." she would quote to him from the Bible on unleavened bread. Y'all might have, it's really hard for me to talk with one hand. <laughs> you know, I'm used to talking with two hands and, and it is just miserably hard. I want to use this one to talk and it hurts like hell. <laughs> um, Huh? Do you need some medical marijuana? Not since 1974. <laughs> he said, and I don't think y'all really needed to know that either. <laughs> but uh, I've already lost these sweet ladies on the front row. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was going to buy another book, but... That boy ain't what we were expecting. <laughs> uh, but uh, he's only got one good arm. <laughs> Are y'all like sitting in judgment of me? <laughs> one of them ladies that look like she's having a good time. I'm a little worried about that. Or maybe they're the library board. No? <laughs> He could not find anyone to teach her how to cook because she was very strong-willed. She was a little bit crazy. So, um, you know, he got, uh, you know, great aunts. You know, he got aunts. He got cousins. And she ran them off. And they'd just leave mad and say, the child is willful. I cannot teach her anything. She would make vegetable soup with no salt. Cool. And we all know how much salt, you know, any tomato-based soup takes, because I am 
very good cook. <laughs> and, um, to make a long story short, he said, uh, my grandfather, who was thin anyway, you know, he had them elbows that looked like onions sticking out. He was thin and with those long muscles and with them big old elbows and huge hands. And, um, and you know, he, 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 there was one person, his daddy, Jimmy Jim, two first names. Jimmy Jim had cooked for logging camps. He had cooked on chain gangs, or for chain gangs, and probably on chain gangs. <laughs> now, he knew beans and ham. He knew cornbread. He knew limons. He knew butter beans. He knew fresh green beans. He knew squash. He knew okra. You know, he knew pork. He knew chicken every way you could do it. And every way that working folks did it, you know. So he, but he was in hiding. So my grandfather got up on the gray mule. My mama wanted me to know it was a gray mule. And he went into the mountains of North Georgia, the high mountains, y'all know where they're at, and found me. And he came riding up, I love this story. He came riding up and here's this old man and he always had an old battered hat and he always he had a, a, a logging mustache. It was that big old thick bushy mustache, but he cut it off, not like Hitler, but <laughs> and he cut it off even with his mouth and it was just huge. And, um, and he just had a, you know, this bleak eye on him, you know, and he always looked, I said that there was a fury in him. And fury is an old fashioned word, but, but it fit him. He was a violent, tough old man. He had been born in, you know, the days after reconstruction. And now he was getting old, facing the great depression. There was a lot of bitterness in that old man. And uh, he looked at his son come riding up, he hadn't seen him in years, and said uh, something to the effect of how emaciated he was. And my favorite quote in the whole book is, and I'll get it wrong because I'm not reading it, but, you know, yes, I am, Daddy, for I have, and this is the way they talk, for I have married a pretty woman who cannot cook. <laughs> And I am starving to death. <laughs> and, you know, that's one of my favorites. But the second favorite, I knew we had a book when I heard that, but I really knew we had a book when my mama said, you know, that, I, would, I took that, y'all probably have some of these, these, those old steel spoons, you know, that are, they're so scarred, they, they're no shine, there's no shine left on them. But they're good spoons, they're heavy spoons. And so I fished one of those out of the drawer because I smelled what was in the oven. And I pulled the door down and looked in there and and slid that guy. My, my mama uses uh, old towels cut into small pieces for pot holders. And I pulled that rack out and there was a, an iron skillet of uh, chicken dressing. And she did not press the whole pieces of chicken down into the dressing. She pulled it off, saving the skin, and then mixed it in, but not to shred it. There are big hunks of chicken inside that. And then that chicken fat had, you know, because you save every bit of the chicken fat had formed a sheen on the top of that dressing, just a little tiny thin, so that when you push that steel spoon into it, it made that sound. <laughs> and and uh, like creme brulee. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked her, where does this come from? And, and she said, well, hon, that goes back to that time Sis shot her husband in the teeth. And it, was, it was Sis Morrison who was the best cook anyone had ever heard of up to that point. And Sis was a formidable woman in size and manner. And 
just was not to be messed with. And uh, she had a husband who was not kind to her. So he, they argued and he was mean to her. And one day, um, you know, he hit her. And, and another day he drew his hand back again. And she said, if you do that, if you reach across this table, I will shoot you. And he said, he called her the B word. And, and she called him the SB word. <laughs> but in Sis's vernacular, she was the greatest cusser in our family history. <laughs> you were not just a plain old SB. This is the way, exactly the way Mama said it. She said, I won't say it like Sis said it. We'll say SB. And I said, okay, Mama. She said, that, you, know, you were a trifling SB or a bandy-legged SB. <laughs> And he drew his hand back and she said, if you, you bandy-legged SB, I will shoot you. And probably said, I'll kill you too. And he did it. And she pulled a snub-nosed 22 revolver out of her pocket and shot him in the teeth. <laughs> and as he, she fired, he turned. And he had... My Aunt Gracie Juanita is one of the great storytellers in our family. She was sitting there with Mama and I said, yeah, did she mean to? Yeah, you know, I thought when they said that she shot him in the teeth, I was hoping they were in like a water glass sitting on the <laughs> She said, no, hon, they were in his mouth. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then I said, well, did, did it kill him? And I goes, you know, that's a bad place to get shot, I guess. <laughs> She said, and my aunt wanted to say, oh, Lord, no, hon, they were that big. <laughs> <laughs> and the bullet from the 22 short, which is the smallest non-BB gun round you can fire at somebody, deflect, now it knocked his teeth out. And it didn't just knock one out, it knocked all these out. Knocked him out, but the bullet flattened on those big teeth and went off yonder way. And later, when discussing it, Sis said, and I will use her language, said, she said, Yeah, that 22, that 22 short was all I had. If I had me a 38, I'd have killed the son of a bitch. <laughs> So this is when I'm thinking, yeah, we got us a book. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the, the best line was when they, they went back to the hospital, you know, because, you know, she regretted it immediately because she loved that man. <laughs> and, and she went back to the hospital to look for him, you know, to check on him, and she, <clears throat> she was afraid that they'd actually look in there. So... Finally, she said to her daughter, Ruby, Ruby, that's him right in there. And her daughter Ruby said, how, how do you know him? She said, because they got them damn teeth in a water glass, and I know them damn teeth in the They had saved his teeth and put them in the water. Now, what in the world are you going to do with a mouthful of shot-out teeth? <laughs> At this rate, one more question ought to take us home. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Did your, did your mother ever teach you to cook? Did you cook with her? That is a somewhat sore subject. <laughs> uh, we were considered um, unclean, <laughs> my brothers and I. Uh, Mom didn't have no girls. So she... I mean, I'm telling you, I mean, she wanted a girl. And she dressed all, uh, every one of us in paint for like a month and a half. <laughs> she wanted a girl. I knew she was going to have a girl and never had a girl. And, uh, and, and we, you know, mama, mama is not fastidious. I mean, you know, she gets flour, you know, around and the pot boils over. She'll deal with it later, you know, but, but, um, but she's a, but she, her kitchen is her kitchen. 
And, you know, we come in with like all manner of poison and effluvium on us. You know, we come in with tadpoles and frogs and turtles. And, you know, we come in with manure and, you know, red mud was the least of it. And she would just banish us. So I listened and, and watched my mama cook from a doorway. And I listened to her sing. I know the song she sang from the doorway. I know the the I, I know her food from a distance of eight feet. And uh, and now I mean it's it, well, you know, I can't cook anything. I I, I can I, for instance I can make sausage gravy because if you think about it it's brutally simple. But I can't make a biscuit because biscuit is not brutally simple. I can't make cornbread. Cornbread is not brutally simple. What's the secret to my mama's cornbread? A, a, a big dollop of mayonnaise. You know, secret to her mashed potatoes. Plenty of butter, plenty of milk. Careful with the salt. Maybe black pepper if you like black pepper. But mostly, you know, black pepper and mashed potatoes will take on a bitter taste that quick. You know, if you overdo it or if you get the wrong kind of black pepper. And nobody wants a spoonful of mashed potatoes with a big crunchy peppercorn in it, right? So, so she's very careful about black pepper in that regard. But, um, but then she adds a little mayo. She adds a teaspoonful of mayo to a And it's, you know, it's the lemon and the creaminess of it. But in cornbread, it just adds a moisture. <coughs> to it. Mama's cornbread is not show place cornbread. It's it's a little bit coarse, you know. It's it's crispy on the bottom, crispy on the top too, just a different kind of crispy because the bacon grease didn't get that far. And um, and you know and it crumbles. You know, it's a mess to eat, you know. You, but I don't like cake cornbread. You know, so Yes, ma'am. Did she put an egg? She didn't put an egg in it then, did she? No, not if the mayo was in there. Now, th there were times when she did not use mayo and she was going for something else, like cornbread muffins, and there was going to be mom, no sugar in your cornbread, which is, you know, that's a sin. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but, but no, you know, but, but yet she made cornbread muffins with just a tiny, tiny little bit of sugar. But those were also often maybe a little, that old black rind, sharp cheddar cheese, maybe a diced green onion in there, and maybe just the tiniest amount, just tiniest amount of, of good hot pepper, but just a little bit, you know. And yeah, I mean, she was, I mean, she, I mean you know, she, Mama was not a scientist, nor was she a magician. She was right in the middle. She was an alchemist. You know, ghosts whispered to her the ingredients and the stories, <laughs> and she knew her stuff. Getting her to tell you how it was cooked was the impossible. It was, I mean, it's impossible. A, a lot of people have asked me, did you test cook those recipes? And I say, yeah, I test ate them. <laughs> I test ate them over, uh, I'm 58, 58 years, and uh, but I, I can't cook. I mean, I am. You know, if I make pinto beans and ham, I can follow her recipe. Big ham, <laughs> cut the trim, everything good from the outside. <laughs> trim the skin, trim the fat and the lean down to that pretty beautiful pink lean and then you can slice that for sandwiches or for bacon or for whatever you want to do but you know cut the bone out mm -hmm. so you have the outside and the inside you got the ham bone which is delicious the cartilage in a ham bone there's no substitute for that yeah. that fat right there there's no substitute for it um, but it's that trimming from the outside which got more smoke and it's, and it, you know, and the skin, a lot of people would throw that away or give it to a dog, you know, no, 
you know, that skin is just, my God, you know, I, mean, I can't even tell you how good it is. At Thanksgiving or Christmas, I'll leave the big turkey or the ham alone and I'll eat the, and, but you know, you use probably, seems like three or four pounds of pork, you know, with two pounds of beans. And you don't get a, you don't get a side, you get something better. You know, you get a thing that, I can't even describe how good it is. I'm not a good enough writer or thinker to describe that broth, that nectar that forms on top of the beans when they're done. Not too much, again, watching that liquid is important. But you know what I mean, that, that about that much of translucent, if it's brown, too brown, and it's not done right. If it's too clear, it's not done right. It should be golden, and it, you know, be that big. And the reason it's golden, I guess, because about 60, 70% of it is ham fat. <laughs> and if you don't like that, fine, give it a whirl with something else, but it won't work. <laughs> it just won't work. And I know there are reasons why people stay away from pork. I understand that. But some dishes, you know, then that case, just look at it and say, boy, I bet that's good, ain't it? And then go to the chicken. <laughs> there are only two or three beef recipes in the whole book. We didn't eat beef. You know, yes, there was theft. Uh, there was chicken theft. And there was pig theft. And there was one cow theft, which was done ingeniously. My great-grandfather, may or may not have led him out onto the railroad trestle. <laughs> Which he called, let nature take its course. What in the hell a locomotive has to do with nature? I don't know. And first of all, have you ever tried to drag a cow out onto a trestle? Cows don't like trestles. Yeah. So, anyway, it, it's uh, those are the stories that are in here. It's a true narrative. It's it, it, in places it will seem a little episodic, but it's a true narrative. It's the history of our food. And if you like a good narrative, I think you'll like it. If you want a cookbook that is scientific, <laughs> that is accurate down to the nth degree. Mm, I'm sure there's some real good ones over there. <laughs> but if you buy it and you don't like it, Mr. Go. Reese has given everybody triple their money back. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing on time? You're not running this show? Who's running this show? <laughs> Are we doing all right? Another question? Let me do, go here and then here. Yes, please. I just want to know with that chicken and dressing, yeah. giblet gravy or not? Not. Um, it's so rich that gravy would be... You didn't need it. You didn't need it. But now, you, you know, we don't eat chicken and dressing without cranberry sauce. Oh, okay. It doesn't matter if it's in August. And we eat chicken and dressing in summer. You know, not even um, chicken and dressing unless you have cranberry sauce. Right. And, it's, and, and Now, we don't have that lovely southern living style chutney <laughs> my mother is not picking wild cranberries from the bog i don't think we have them down here but she's also she's not doing that there's no like tangerine cranberry salsa we don't do that our cranberry sauce comes in a can <laughs> from the IGA, and if it does not make that sound, if it takes just two shakes to get it out, it's inferior cranberry sauce. Three hard shakes and then that sound, right? And I mean, I mean, come on, I mean, really, who's watching? You know, who's looking? Nobody. You know, nobody's looking. It's good. It tastes good. I've had, you know, look, I've lived a big part of my adult life around people putting on airs. And, and, and I like the, the chutney and the, you know, I like that. It's really good. But it's not ours. <laughs> ours comes from a can. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You like pot maker? 
Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> but, but see, here's the thing. I, I'll eat pot liquor from everything. I'll eat pot liquor from... Because it's not just greens, you know. I, I'll eat pot liquor from squash, boiled squash, peas, anything like that. But, but, uh, the best pot liquor is collards. And I think the reason is because with collards, you watch your water real close. And again, anything, as we know, anything cooked down. And even the chefs on TV say that. But, but you know, I mean, pot liquor from like good collards. And collards, to me, are like the best green anyway because they're dense you know and and I like a, a dense green I don't like a I don't like a mushy green you, you know what I mean so, yeah no that's a good question yes yes sir and then we'll go right here did, did she ever uh, refer to her cornbread that she cooked in her iron skillet on top of the stove as a hoe cake. Yeah, if it was cooked on top of the stove, it was always smaller and it was a hoe cake, or more likely three. And and that was most popular with cornbread and milk because sometimes you might not make a whole, you know, skillet of cornbread. I almost said pan of cornbread. Yeah, we call it pan, pan of cornbread. It ain't never in a pan. It's always in a skillet. Yeah. <laughs> but she might not make a whole skillet of cornbread if she wants cornbread and buttermilk. But the same ritual every time. Three whether she wanted one or not, she cooked three. Three oak cakes. Uh, you got to have just the slightest amount of burn on it. You know, just the slightest amount of burn on it. And then, you know. Do you, do you have any idea how that came to be called that? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, I guess. A hoe. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, I actually have heard. heard. Yeah. I have heard, you know, they yeah. cooked on the hoe. Well, they we heated we, up the blade right. of the hoe. The See, spray. our hoes were too busy to cook anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I broke that. I broke that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a wonder. That's a beautifully rustic notion. But I guarantee you, I worked with Uncle Ed. He never let a hoe get <laughs> stay still. Yeah, long you bit. kept moving. It had to been a hell of a hoe cake. To stay <laughs> but I, I'm sorry, y'all. I got away from my microphone. But I. Uh, <laughs> You know, it was always the same. Crumble that hoe cake while it's still hot. And she would eat it in a glass sometimes, you know, or, or a big coffee cup, right? Uh, but she would never a bowl. Never a bowl. And she would use only whole buttermilk, you know, a good fattening kind. And she would sometimes chop a raw onion up, but she always had a green onion. Man, if she had a green onion, you know, she was happy. The only thing my mom ever stole was she stole an onion once. And I said, why in the world did you steal an onion? She said, it was out in this field. I knew they'd already gleaned it, you know. And, 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 and it was just there. And it was going to go away. So I got it. We didn't have no onion. And the, all, none of that meant a damn thing except we didn't have no onion. You know, everything else was a qualifier. And, you know, but, uh, but yeah, you got to have something with cornbread milk, I believe. Uh, I'll be honest with you, you know, we ate it so much when I was a kid, I don't eat it now. You know, I just can't, you know, there's some things you can't, you know what I mean? Some things you can't do. Now, who was next? And, yes, ma'am. I was going to ask about the poke salad. How did she prepare a poke salad? Arduously. <laughs> rinse it. Pour the water out, rinse it again. Rinse it again. You know. Cook it. Pour the water out cook it again. Sometimes cook it a third time. When you get down to the, you know, never use any of the stalk. Obviously you don't use the root and there would be no reason to use the berries, but you know, the berries will kill you dead, but the stalk will kill you quicker. So she would, I mean, you know all this, and, and then she would, but, but she would try to stick with the you know, she would, you know, you know, you can even get a rash, you can get poisoned by handling it. Hammond the salt. So only after it had been washed three times and cooked two or three times and then fried in an iron skillet with an egg. And I think they put the egg in there just so they mm -hmm. have something that had some taste to it. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you know, slivered green onion. Slivered green onion. But the, to be honest with you, I've had it. I ate it as a child. I liked it. Anything fried we liked. But but I also fell in love with stewed anything. Stewed uh, squash. You know, just beautiful, you know, 
fried okra and fried green tomatoes were not deep fried like in a sports bar. <laughs> they were scrambled and, and there was very little cornmeal mm -hmm. used on the cornmeal on the okra, sometimes flour or cornmeal or a mix on the, on the green fried tomatoes. But the green fried tomatoes were a, this beautiful mess. <laughs> and she loved to take a tiny <clears throat> tomato you know, one right in the middle. Not one of them peak things you get at the grocery store, but a turn in tomato and boy, scramble that. You know, you just dust it with flour, salt and pepper, and scramble it in bacon grease. That was really good. Yeah, but poke salad, I, I told mom, I said, I don't even think you like it. She said, it's medicine. <laughs> and I said, no, ma'am, it's poison. Yeah. <laughs> and she said, who's the cook? <laughs> Thank y'all.